Hello. Welcome. We are the intern ministers at Community Church of New York in Manhattan. We are Unitarian Universalists in the process of becoming ordained clergy. In this podcast, we delve into the life of an intern minister. We explore the ways our lives and internships intersect and how this is ministerial formation. I'm Megan Henry. I'm Carrie McAvoy. And we're, and we're revving, revving up. up. <laughs> Hey there, Revving Up community. We are so thrilled to be back with you again this week. Uh, we have some listeners, uh, viewers, listeners or viewers in our community who have been engaging a little bit with us and um, have joined our Facebook group. So we're really excited about that. And I just especially want to give a shout out to Randy, who has been a consistent listener and um, commenter and liker on our Facebook posts. And I just really appreciate that, Randy. Thank you so much for engaging with us. And I can't wait to have our live event at the end of May, where we will be able to chat back and forth a bit live on the air on Facebook. So last week, um, we released a a little bite uh, of my story of um, how I, um, just kind of like my path, Megan's story, uh, my path on into ministry and how I uh, attempted to begin on the path. Well, and I really did begin, but it took me a long time from when I was in my early 20s uh, to now in my late 40s. And I'm really, um, grateful to people for listening and engaging. It's kind of, you know, we're putting ourselves out there. It's a little <laughs> vulnerability to share some of these, um, you know, intricacies of our lives. And I feel very held um, and cared for in this community. I really appreciate that. And that's one of the great things about being in a faith community, I think. And um, so Carrie, I would love if you would be willing to do the same and share some about your story and we kind of framed it um this particular piece very um like grounded in economic realities and mm -hmm. how that kind of uh, plays out for um different ones of us at our different stages in our lives and i wonder if you'd be willing to share of course yeah um and yeah it comes the economic reality is 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 a thing um, how to make this seminary experience doable. And uh, so for me, um, I worked in information technology for all, pretty much all of my professional life. And um, when I heard the call to ministry, um, I quit that job and started pulling out of my retirement to make it financially work. So um, basically pulling from my nest egg because um, seminary was that important and uh, I've been blessed in that I had resources to pull from I know that many of my fellow students don't don't have that to pull from mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, quite a few of us in at least me the Lombard are approaching this as a second career uh, which is um, you know, one, of, one of the many paths to seminary um, yeah and it seems like that's kind of like it's a big you're, you're pretty really risking a lot by taking, you know, money out of your nest egg that you had put in for retirement um, in order to pursue this, um, this calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and it's not just money, right? It's, um, it's time. Like um, I had to quit my job. I couldn't work. And do an internship or uh, the chaplain training that is required. We have to do one unit of clinical pastoral education, which is either um, a nine month program that you do on top of whatever else you're doing in your life, or you have to take a summer off and do full time for 11, 12 weeks. 
so um, beyond just money, it, it to be in seminary, it really requires some time spent out that you cannot be earning money. Or if you are earning money, it makes it very, very difficult to really complete the, all of the tasks that are required. That's right. And for many people, I mean, it's very difficult to find a, a unit of clinical pastoral education, which we shorten as CPE. Friends, if you hear CPE, that's what we're talking about. Um, it's very difficult to find one of those that, that pays or that includes a stipend. Rather, um, like for what I'm doing, I'm doing my program this summer for 12 weeks at Bellevue Hospital in Manhattan, and it costs me $700 to have that training and to participate in that program. So that's an additional cost that um, you know, if you're looking at everything, all the paperwork, and you might know about that ahead of time, right? But it's the, one of those things that can be a surprise, I think, for people. Yeah, yeah, I think most people end up paying to do their clinical pastoral education, and then on top of it, have to take time off of work. So, um, and then there's other things like creating the massive amounts of paperwork that are required to even apply for a, for a clinical pastoral education program, interviews, uh, medical records, you know, it's just so many tasks that aren't even, or, that you're not even aware of to start with. Right. Isn't the background check like $200 or something like that? Mm, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's, that's required. And then of course there's the, um, uh, uh, what's it called? The evaluation, oh, the career assessment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a couple thousand dollars right there. And two days off of work. Plus all the time it takes to fill out all oh of gosh, the essays and the paperwork ahead of time to, <laughs> yeah. And the, that test that you take that has to be proctored. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It is a lot, lot of time. Yeah. And for people who are doing this as a second career, like for some, some people I've known have retired, have been able to go into retirement from their first or second career and then pursue the ministry, um, which is a different, a whole different way of doing it. Um, and it's funny, it feels to me like if I were young and had like relatively no debt or relatively few responsibilities, then I would be maybe more willing to jump in and like go on this route that would be, you know, taking out loans and all of those kinds of things. And maybe I wouldn't have already, you know, a child or a job or things like that, that would make it more difficult. And then there's the other end of it, which is retirement, right? Where you may have a nest egg built up. Um, you can take, you have the time, you know, it's like a whole, but then what about everybody in between, you right. know, which yeah. is interesting because I think you and I both fall in that in-between category of, well, we're kind of in the midst of doing other things also. And so how do you make room and move those things around? And I would, work, I would wonder if I were, you know, quitting my job or like giving up my career in order to pursue ministry, I would be concerned around like, well, what if this ministry thing doesn't work out? Then I've lost all this time. And then I have to try to get back into the game. And when you're out of it for a couple, three, four years, oof, it's hard to get back in. That's where, that's where faith comes in, right? Yeah. <laughs> Leap of faith, for sure. It's all <laughs> going to work out in some way. <laughs> yeah. And so many people have already have student loan debt from the first or second time, you know, I mean, many people come into the Unitarian Universalist ministry, highly educated, which probably means that they have already student loans that they're paying back from those first degrees. Like I have, I have a, a bachelor's in religious studies. I have a master's in philosophy and religion um, with a minor in what was then called women's studies. And mm, so I have those two degrees and I'm, I am still paying back those loans. Um, they're down right around $10,000 now, which is why I felt like, okay, that's manageable to go ahead and like try this <laughs> third degree. But um, yeah, it's a lot to take on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, it, it, the whole need to take out student loans for this program, I mean, um, it's a graduate program, right? We're getting Masters of Divinity, which means that 
you need a bachelor's degree before you come into the to, into the program. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know many of our fellow students who are uh, having to take out student loans. And then once we graduate, it's not like ministry is this lucrative position, particularly since when we graduate right out of seminary, what are the kinds of positions we can really get? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we're going to get that plum senior minister position that that pays pays well so how how do we make that work or is it even possible to make that work and what does that mean to uh in our values uh and in our in our faith where people are members of our congregations are expecting us to be prepared and have the degrees that we need to be effective ministers and yet um, there's no financial way for us to make it work. Well, it weeds out, it weeds out a whole bunch of people. The process and the financial, um, burden, um, means that there are many people who probably just don't even give it a try, which means that we are limiting, like then our faith, um, is limited to being served by ministers who are either, um, young without a lot of responsibilities and already accrued debt and things like that or they're much older and retired um and or they have they are already wealthy they have a spouse who can support them um they have parents who can support them so we tend to then have the leaders of our faith being dominated by a small subsection of um, our population. And then that makes me wonder, like, is it this, like what comes first, the chicken or egg? Is it the system that has created this or was it that Unitarian Universalists were already of um, a certain kind of uh, like highly educated, fairly well off. And so they created systems that then kept people who don't fit that mold out even unintentionally i i don't you know if that that could have been a system that was created um without realizing oh yeah and so now we're going to be limiting all these people won't be able to to serve us which means that then our membership will keep staying and the way that it is because the people who are being um who are represented up in the pulpit the people who are in front the people who are speaking if that only is representing a very small subset of the population, then all the rest of the diversity, like people of different races, economic status, ages, not see, will not be seeing themselves represented in those leadership positions and may not feel like there's a place for them or that they, you know, really are welcome or that it's, uh, you know, that it, it will fit their needs. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, those are some pretty big questions. Yeah. Yeah. Some really big questions. Who is, who is being left out of our pulpits as a result of just economic realities mm -hmm. of becoming a, a minister? And then we don't really pay ministers the kind of money that many of the congregants earn in their, if, if they're in these higher level jobs. Mm -hmm. Right. So then it's like, okay, are ministers, are we just like thinking of ministers as these, like in this like kind of old fashioned, um, I don't know if it would be necessarily Protestant or, or Christian, but just like an old, old fashioned idea of like, well, the minister is this, this self-sacrificing person who is above all of these, you know, material things and that they you know used to be the, that as a minister or a pastor you would live in the home that was provided by that community um you know so it was just it, um, not exactly taking a vow of poverty but you know it it's a similar kind of concept in a way yeah taking a vow of poverty but still knowing um all of the appropriate vintages at the same time uh-huh whoa yeah <laughs> great way to put that <laughs> so there are scholarships available and i know that sometimes seminarians don't apply for them because they don't feel like they're needy enough 
Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, I definitely can speak from my own personal experience in that way of um, I have not applied for the funds that our seminary was offering um, due to like COVID related expenses. Um, and a big part of that was because I didn't want to take money from other people that might need it more than me. And so, you know, I mean, I just was like, I don't really need it, you know, I, but I'm also somebody who didn't grow up with money and I don't have inherited wealth. And so money has not been like a big um, concern for me in some ways. It's kind of like, well, if I have it, that's great. If I don't, yeah, I can definitely survive because I know how to do that because I, I have that experience. So, um, so that it's also an interesting perspective um, around that. But I, I know that I did not apply for um, many things because I knew that there were other people who needed it more than I did. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't applied for any for the same reason. And I know that um, I've heard that some scholarship programs, like the one uh, by Community Church offers, uh, the John right. Haynes Holmes Scholarship, um, they were shaking the br shaking the brush to to get people to apply for it. So, mm -hmm. my my advice to seminarians is, if you need the money, for goodness sake, apply for it. That's what it's there for. Yeah, for sure. And. What can our faith do better to make sure that the that the people we want preaching from the pulpit can make it there in the first mm -hmm. place? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I also do want to just like maybe put a pin in this other thought that I just had, which is that there's something about Unitarian Universalism that that structurally leaves very little room for people to be involved in the leadership of our faith without being ordained clergy. And so that's like a whole nother topic, but I just kind of want to put a pin in that because right now we're just so focused on this idea of on this ordination path. Um, and I wonder what happens to a faith also when really the only way people can figure out how to be very involved in it and to be leaders within it are to become ordained clergy. And maybe that leads to even people becoming ordained and being ministers who are just like, I would have been fine to just be the executive director or, you know, bring my other skills in other ways, but there's just not a lot of avenues, um, just something else to consider. Um, and yes, Carrie, what was that other thing you said? Oh, what can we do to open up the space for more mm -hmm. diverse a more diverse population to be our ministers and serving our faith in that way. Mm -hmm. um, great question. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any answers to that. Mm -hmm. That's right, because one of the things that we may be talking about next week are like a lot of the structures that are in place to um, hold us as ministers and to provide accountability for ministers and leadership. And I think when I think of the ministerial fellowship committee process to becoming um, fellowshipped. It is in some ways, you know, it's not like arduous process, but it's just like, there's a lot of steps and there's a lot of things to do. And so there means oh, there's a lot of things to accidentally not realize that you have to do and to forget. And so that system is also like, there's the financial, there's the economic issue. There's also the, the, the structural issues um, that make it uh, a bit difficult. And then I wonder, well, isn't, isn't the idea that that's kind of a good thing because that means you really, really want it to do it. Um, and it shows that you're like super committed. You'll do all of these things to be, you know, to become a minister. Um, but then it kind of could can jump the fence over into that whole um, sacrificing and martyrdom syndrome as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where is where is the balance in all of this? Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting because one of the things I'm learning in a class right now is how if we want the world to be a certain way, it's important to start it on a small scale. So um, some of the barriers that that seminarians run into is the cost of of education and healthcare and taking care of your family and so forth. So 
how can we, um, I know that some of these things are very in line with what Unitarian Universalists want to see in the world. So how do we start building that within our system, starting with the people who lead our faith? Yeah, like what, what would it look like if our, if all of our congregations used the privilege, clout, and power and authority that we have to um, abolish student debt and to get universal health care free in this country? Because if you think about how much money it costs, even just for a congregation to provide health insurance through the UUA health insurance plan or any health insurance plan, um, that means that that congregation is spending tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes 40,000, 50,000, $60,000 a year just on health insurance. So if we had universal health care, then, then that money would be freed up to send people to seminary, to um, fund the UUA um, programs, to pay for another, a whole other staff position that's maybe not ordained clergy. You know, just like so many things. So what we could do as a faith is really live, our, live out these values in the world by advocating for these kinds of systemic change. And that is gonna help everyone, including us. And in the meantime, how, how do we create those structures within our organization that we wanna see in the world? That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we're, as always, thrilled to be part of this conversation with you, and we hope that you will join us in conversation on our um, Facebook, Revving Up Facebook group, um, and send us an email, podcast at ccny.org. We'd love to hear from you. This is a community conversation and a media ministry. We're so glad that you're here to watch and listen and email and write and think and all that good stuff. Thanks for being here today. Bye everyone. Bye.